but I appreciate the thing. So the minute you bring something up, they're like looking for it. Uh, in uh, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16 says, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save your, both yourself and your hearers. And here's Paul telling Timothy and, and God allowing us all to be in on this because the Spirit carried man as they wrote the Word of God. And that's how the Bible came to be, and there's many scriptures that say that. Uh, it says, watch your life. Well, we all have a life. But doctrine means, from God's point of view, is what you live by. That would be the Word of God. Yeah. And it says, persevere in them. Why? Because it's not going to be a natural fit. Right. We're all sinners. We sin. And our nature is rebellion. And we're not going to want to uh, uh, really, in our nature, really uh, trust everything God says. We'll trust some of the stuff. But then when, but then when it goes against our understanding, it's a, it's, it's a challenge. But persevere also when you're struggling or in sins that you may have committed or stuff happens in life that just doesn't seem fair. You, you, God calls you still to be righteous. That's why you need to persevere. That means it's challenging, and you're having, it, 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 you need to, uh, you know, man or woman up spiritually and go, I need God. I need to real. this doesn't feel good, but I'm still going to be righteous yeah. and pray. And it says, because, why? Because if you do, you're going to save both yourself and your hearers. What are, what are we talking about? Talking about resurrection, talking about salvation, talking about you got to get the doctrine right. You got to make sure, don't just go to church. You got to find out what is true religion from God's point of view. True religion is how do you enter the kingdom? How do you be saved? It's grace, but there is an entrance of submission and humility to obeying God's direction on how to do it. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a great point. I love the song. Alfonso, you do a great job. Charles, you always do a great job on leading the worship. Thank you very much. Thank you. Title of the lesson is No Resurrection Without the Cross. We all know that, but I know a lot of times uh, resurrection, that was the party time, and it is. When you're right in, in Christ, when you're taking communion and, you know, you're walking daily and understanding the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord would be, you understood what that means and what you are doing is he's Lord, then it, it is a celebration because yeah. you're not wasting grace. You're not in this false grace. You understand the strength that it takes to be in the grace, even when you're having challenges. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Come on, Chris. You know, without the cross, the cross symbolized death. It was death. Back in the Roman days, Jesus wasn't the only person that died on the cross. Anybody knew what a cross meant. It was being erected on the hills. The, Roman, the Romans uh, really uh, perfected the art of crucifixion, a brutal, slow, torturous death. Very sad, but true. And it was designed that way, to be a slow death. But it meant death. Suffering and death. In verse 14, it says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. No resurrection without the cross, and we see this beautiful description of how Jesus is God, but also 100% human. And, you know, as flesh and blood people, we can't die and enter the kingdom of heaven unless we have the doctrine on right by what is your salvation based on? Where, how, do, how do you, what is belief in God based on? It has to go back to the doctrine, your knowledge of the truth. God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. So there's a faith, like what is your faith in God based on? I mean, if you ask the people, they'd have all kinds of references probably. But unless it's truly matching up with what you're saying with the scripture truth, 
if it's not, there's, there, may, there may be a problem, and maybe you didn't even know it, there was a problem. But then when you're shown, the true test is, are you going to be humble or are you going to be prideful? That's the greatest sin, pride. Fear of death. Maybe you don't think about it. But I can tell you this, if you've had a near-death experience, I don't care who you are, atheist or person, you're going, you, if you have time to actually, if you just, you know, you're not hit by a bus, but you have time to actually realize you could die, I promise you're not going to be thinking of anything else except what's going to happen to me. And you may not think about that much in your whole life. Because you're not going to think about your career, your car, your, 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 you may think about your loved ones. Like if you could tell someone, hey, tell them I love them or something. But ultimately, you're going to go, where am I going and what's going to happen to me? And if, they're, and, and, and if you are right with God, you're going to go, God, check my heart. Right. That's the only thing. Because what matters when you die? You can't take anything with you. And no resurrection without the cross. Jesus knew that. He didn't just die. He didn't just raise from the dead. He walked the talk and showed us that we need to suffer with our own sins. Not, not just because he's saying, hey, suffer, but when we decide to walk with Christ and, and obey God and follow Christ, there's going to be a suffering and a cross involved. Jesus says, carry your cross daily. Why? Because you're naturally understanding that you can't live that life without the grace and the blood of Christ and the sacrifice, which means God wants you to ask for help. God wants you to persevere. And when you need to persevere, you need help. You need encouragement from God and one another to not give up. Point number one is do not be afraid of anyone or anything. Well, in Matthew 28, verse 5, that's what God says. Now, in 2006... I was in the Phoenix Church. I was leading the Phoenix Church. No, it was I don't know. Matt Sullivan may have. I was leading, and then Matt Sullivan and Helen. I bled for a while, and then Matt and Helen came. Sonia and I led, and Matt and Helen came and assumed leadership. Uh, who leads the Miami Church now? But I can't quite remember. I think it was uh, in the middle of that. But in 2006, there was a gentleman named Bill Secor. Can you put the picture up of that? And see that man that looks like uh, he can't express himself? I mean, it's kind of a like a picture at first. You go, what's going on? And that's my dad, Neil, and that was his best friend growing up. And my dad started coming around to church, and he and Bill Secor, the guy in the middle, lived in Phoenix. And he was interested, kind of, because my dad was starting to go to church, and he was asking questions. And we'd get into, we'd get into questions and stuff, and he would... Uh, he would always be blocked by a certain doctrinal issue in the scriptures, and I didn't bring it up. He'd always ask me certain things, and because he didn't like my answer, he would kind of stand off, and he would attend and kind of get into a little, not argument, but, he, you know, disagreement, and then he wouldn't come for a while. And you can keep it up for a minute. I want to, I want to make a point. The, um, he broke his hip. He had Parkinson's disease for already, and he was kind of thin, and he was older, and he broke his hip between his ongoing stuff, and he ended up going to the hospital, and my dad was visiting him, and he'll tell you, before we were there, and he was started to shriek out loud, you know, crying out loud in the hospital, I don't, I, I don't want to go to hell, truly. My dad was like, Bill, what's going on, what's going on? I don't want to go to hell, and he literally said, get Chris, mm -hmm. because I was the minister at that time, and this is profound, because we had debates, not debates, but he would bring up things. And then when we hit a doctrinal point where he didn't like what the Bible taught, uh, he stopped. Which is not my, it's not my business. I still loved him, but I can't compromise the doctrine. I just show him. Yeah. But now he's in, he's in bed, and, and this is, the way he looks is after he's baptized, he can't smile because of the Parkinson's disease and the weakness of all his functions. He wasn't going to get out of the hospital. He was so, since he was elderly and he was already thin, he had to be fed by a tube. He, was, he wasn't able to get strong enough, so his vital signs were starting to shut down. And he can't smile, but you can see the relief in his face. That's right when he got out of the waters. It was like, and I whispered into his ear, he, well, I'm going to tell what happened. He was in, <laughs> he, when he was crying out about, uh, you know, dying, I came, and I started to ask him, and we started to look at scriptures. And you, we didn't just do this emotional prayer. That's not in the Bible. That's right. It's not in the Bible. We had to get in the scriptures. 
I had to ask him where he's coming from. Does he believe in Jesus? Who is Jesus? And we had to read the scriptures and help him ask him when he read these, do you believe? And then we had to go in, and then I had to get others involved. Matt Sullivan, Mark Garrido, who's coming up next week to preach. He's a, you guys are going to get a kick out of him. He's an amazing uh, uh, man of God. Uh, he's got his own way. <laughs> which is great because he got he got converted late in his life he was like a street kid 15 or 14 he was on the streets yeah. he's got a great story yeah. uh but so he started crying out. so we had different people and it took like two or three days to study with him because you can't just fast forward and just go yeah you, you can't even emotionally he's got to understand what is he making a decision jesus is lord and christ so you can't just go yes he had to make decisions that if he got out of that hospital he's going to really live and, 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 and strive to live as Jesus calls him as Lord. And that would involve, what does it mean with Jesus' church? What's the church? So we had to, you, he had to go by and believe and have a conviction. And, but that's after he got baptized. I'm going to take the picture down. After he got baptized, he went, because oh, he couldn't really smile. So right, if I explain that, there's a huge weight off him. He's like going, oh. We had to go through three marriages with him. Lots of sin. We had to dig in there and help him get in touch with real sin, not just, uh, you know, uh, vaguely going, oh, yeah, I forgive my sins. No, you got to get in touch with Amen. what your life was and what you remember, not like in stuff you can't remember, that's fine, but your heart had to get in touch yeah. because Jesus died for those sins. So you got to get broken, Amen. a contrite and broken heart. God says he wants you to get godly sorrowful. So we went through it, and he finally, as he went through it, he got so in touch, and I know this because afterwards, after he'd done and we studied enough for him to understand if he gets out, this is Seeking for His Kingdom, he even the next day he said, i got to tell you one more thing, and his voice was very shut down. He's like, i, I, I got to tell you one more thing. He goes, I lusted toward this other sister. I said, all right, you're, you're, amen, bro. You're he was trying to get, you know, obviously, there was nothing he wanted to hold back. Yeah. And then he got baptized in about... Five or six days within a week, he died. We had brothers come in and sisters, and they'd introduce, hi, I'm your sister, I'm your brother, and they'd read scripture, and we'd have people rotate coming in and say to him and encourage him. He shared with everybody, the nurse, the insurance people, the health insurance people, and he made a list. He had his wife made a list. There was like 50 people that he wanted us to tell about Jesus. Very moving. It wasn't this watered-down emotional deal. He really realized, I don't want to go to hell. And, and, and it was like uh, amazing. So... You don't be afraid of anything. He was afraid of death when it was right there. Right. Believe me, if you're not being totally humble and you just convince yourself and make statements and you don't know the scriptures really, when you're on your deathbed, I promise, and I hope you get it before this, don't just be, know what's going on and know where you're at daily Amen. as you're walking with God to the disciples who understand the truth. It's not, it's, it's stay saved and be faithful in the Christ. And in Matthew 28, verse 5, it says, The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. So this angel, which is powerful, announces the good news of the resurrection to the woman and gave him really four messages, four points within these scriptures. Do not be afraid. Yeah. God says that over 365 times in different ways in the scriptures. Amen. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. Have no fear. Take courage. The reality of the resurrection brings joy, not fear. Women, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, when you are afraid, remember the empty tomb. Yes, come on. He says he's not here. Check for yourself. Jesus is not dead. He's not to be looked for among the dead. He, he, he is alive. Right. He's among his people. He is alive now. He, it, the Bible says in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Two interactive words, the body and then the church. Body of Christ and church is the physical representation of disciples of Christ made Jesus Lord wherever you're at in the world. Jesus is leading his people. Yes. Now, he's leading this church. He's the leader of the church. I'm just a servant like you guys. <laughs> he says, come and see. He says, come and see. The woman could check the evidence herself. The tomb was empty then, and the tomb is empty today. Look at yes. 
if you go look for uh, Allah's uh, bones or, or uh, Buddha or Muhammad, you're going to find their bones in the grave. Yeah. You're not going to find Jesus' bones in the grave. Amen. Uh, the resurrection is a true historical fact. Just like historical facts, even other facts that have been hundreds or thousands of years later are even coming up for dispute. You know, it's funny how Jesus told, to, was, if Jesus would have done that in our day and age, you could say, well, man, there wouldn't be a doubt because everybody would have their phones out as he walked along the Via Del Rosa, and they would be filming little blips of him being tortured and beat. And just like today, most people would just film and not try to step in because they're afraid they'd get beat up by the Romans, which they probably would. Yeah. But today, people can watch people being abused or insulted, and everybody watches or films it, and the majority doesn't, no one, everybody's afraid to get involved. Not everybody, but it shows the sinful nature of humanity. Yeah. But why didn't he do it where we could all prove it and take little videos and selfies with them? Hey, I'm at the crucifixion. <laughs> I ain't lying, but some people would be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he had many witnesses. He appeared to 500 brothers at one time, it says in Corinthians. Yeah. He walked the earth for 40 days after he rose from the dead on earth. Many people didn't know that. Acts chapter 1, it says that. He showed himself, and that, and people came back to life. Holy people that were Jewish people that died already from the tombs. They came out of the graves. Yes. They died again. But tell me if God didn't make a stamp. Yes. This happened now 2,000 years later. Let me tell you something. Just because it's historical fact, it's, it's like it's, it's gone. It's a memory, and they didn't have any documentation. Yes. But it happened. We have the scriptures as documentation. Yes. That's why God allowed testifying true witnesses that aren't insane and, and writing these things down. Because you can't just say oh, the Bible's a good book. You either got to throw it in the trash or fully accept it because either Jesus is a complete, insane, mentally ill patient because he says things that he, if he's not God, he's insane. Right. And we've seen other people, unfortunately, you know, uh, that, have, that are mentally ill that said, I am the Messiah, I am yeah. Jesus. I think I studied with someone in Los Angeles when they came around there in church and they, we got together and, and, and he was telling me he was the Messiah. And I was like, hey, uh, do we have any water? Does anybody have anything to drink in here? I was like, I was just praying in my head when I was doing it. I go, what do I do with this? <laughs> the Bible says the Messiah already came, so how you doing? <laughs> so he says, go quickly and tell them. The angel tells her to go quickly. They were to spread the news just like we should go quickly and continue to tell everyone we know. Uh, you know, in, in the end of that verse, is, he, 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 go quickly and tell. Jesus, the angel says, go tell the other disciples. Go tell. Get this word out. It's accurate. Keep it accurate. Yeah. And we're going to give you the scriptures. Point number two is raised to a new raised consciousness. So you can say a raised consciousness. See, if you don't enter the kingdom, you might have common sense, book sense, trained sense, but you don't have... Uh, or common sense, and common sense is not going to even come close to uh, the wisdom from God. Yeah. And you don't get the wisdom until you get the Spirit. Right. We're going to see that in a minute. So I'm going to read from this book I'm reading, which I love reading books that open up your eyes more and help you look at the Scriptures. But it says here, uh, he, he's writing, he says, in, 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 he says, I think God has been either terribly misunderstood or tragically misrepresented. All God's, wait a minute, I did this for purpose. I brought my reading glasses and put them in my jacket so I remember. Come on, no, you don't, all right. Okay, come on, honey. All right, so all God uh, misrepresented, all God seems to be known for is legalism, rules, judgments, commands, and wrath. In fact, Jesus calls us to live a life of unimaginable adventure, not legalism. Come on. But we do need to be devoted and, and not be uh, contra, uh, compromising or, or lukewarm. Amen. We need to be sold out and not be willing to compromise even if we offend someone because of our truth, not because we're trying to be rude. Come on. Uh, it's easy to get sentimental. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 10. And I love it because... This book is called Burning Daylight, and it talks about uh, having everybody has the same moments, but if you don't keep the mind of Christ, like I talked about last uh, at Family Midweek, 
yeah. uh, the mind of Christ, it, you, 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 you lose the awareness, the subconscious awareness of the presence of God. Yeah. And you might intellectually go, God is everywhere. But if you don't keep that connection, life gets stale and boring, even in the monotony that life does bring. Life is not going to be this huge jump off cliffs. We do need to go to work and do the day and day things that are routine, but you shouldn't get, make it routine. Every moment is walking with God. Amen. John 10, verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Amen. I just want to make a shout out. I never do this, but shout out to my brother, Jeff Klopek, and I think his wife, Diana, in Oklahoma. I know they're watching right now. Good, good for you. So here he talks about a gate. There's an entrance into God's kingdom. There's an entrance into Christ. And it's a gate. And a gate is you got to find it and open it and go through it. There's got to be an entrance. Nicodemus in John chapter 3, don't go there, but he says, Jesus tells Nicodemus, a learned Pharisee who had all, this, all the truth known uh, that you could from the Old Testament. And he says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and spirit. Yeah. And he goes, how can you be born again when you're old? I mean, how can you go back in your mother's womb? He didn't understand. And this is a guy that would have thought he was right. Yeah. He had to humble out and go, what else do I not know? Yes. There's an entrance because Jesus says, I'm the gate. I'm a door, he says in other places. So what would that mean? And what that actually means is you got to find out from God's word, the doctrine, how do, how do I enter? And it's all grace, but there's got to be a way of humility to agree because everybody has kind of a different slice yeah. in the Christian dome, so to speak, yeah. on how to be right with God. And then when they get down to the Bible, people get angry. Yeah. You think you're splitting hairs. No, we're not. We're just saying this is, there's a plan and context, and you got to be humble. You're saved by grace, no works, but we got to be humble. Amen. And we got to stay humble. Amen. So, and then I love how it says, I've come that they may have life, life to the full. And, and think about that. We all know that scripture, but I would even say it's unimaginable adventure. But, but why doesn't it stay that way at times? Why does it not seem that? Why, do we, why at times, myself included, I'm from Ireland, myself. <laughs> It's not an unimaginable adventure for me at times. I don't think about subconsciously at times where I'm at where I feel like I have life to the full in the moments. Okay. Come on, Chris. Keep your I woke up this morning staring at the ceiling. And I didn't let Sonia know. <laughs> Keep it real, Melvin. <laughs> the staring at the ceiling when you wake up, you know there's something off. If you're just staring, continue to stare. It's either you don't want to get up or you got something to face or you haven't dealt with something right or you're just not doing, you just don't feel good spiritually, not physically. And it was just because I had to walk myself out like I do now because of this new injury. And a lot of times I got to walk myself into my thoughts to get in the right mindset of realizing I have an unimaginable adventure and not look at the things as, and, and remember who I was before this happened. I, that doesn't do any good. You can only go forward and go, what am I learning? But I got to walk myself back faithfully, intellectually, with the doctrine, the promises. And then I can really realize, okay, it's adventure time because God, Jesus came to give me a full life, not destroy me. The devil wants to destroy me. Look in, uh, so what do I mean by unimaginable? Well, look in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. You know, when you were a kid... Didn't you have a, a bigger imagination than you do now? Oh, yeah. Well, why? Because when we become, you know, there is a maturity issue where you got to become. But why don't we have that wild imagination as adults? You know, not, I'm not including immaturity. Not be a, you know, you got to go to work and you're not just going to, you know, you're going to be responsible. But imagine, your imagination is still free. And you can, you can, you have to decide that to make it a full life. Otherwise, the way you look at each thing, your job, your work, instead of, you know, 
You may want a better job, but instead of dwelling on this job I don't like, and I say, you got to go, amen, God, I know you're going to give me a better job, but right now I'm grateful for the fact that I can have a job. So you got to change that, right? Yeah. Nothing really changes that moment, but it gets you to get excited about an adventure if that's the case in that situation. Yeah. Marriage, I'm having bumps. I feel like I'm not in the feeling zone where I used to be with my spouse. I'm not talking about me. I love my wife right now, but I've, I've, I've been there. Sonia's been there. We don't, there's been times we're married as of April 1st, 26 years, and thank you for your encouragement. But we weren't, we're not always in the feel like, oh, I just, I have the, 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 little, the, little, the little warm fuzzies. We work it out because we're either at odds, offended, or, or uh, disrespected or something. So I don't go, I don't feel you anymore. No. God said, I do. I said, I do to God. Jesus said, I do to the cross. Amen. And I said, I do to Sonia. So do. Okay. And agape love is not going by feelings. I, I love Sonia to the end, even though I need to work out my own sin. And it goes back to humility. On, and same with you guys in the marriage, because your marriage should be an unimaginable venture, not an unimaginable nightmare. <laughs> Look, in, and, and it will be there if you don't grasp the truth of God and walk your thoughts back in first for you to be righteous and repent and deal with what you got to deal with. And it says in chapter 12, verse one, it says, I must go on boasting. Wow. Paul's really prideful. I'm just kidding. He's not boasting and you'll see what he's doing. He's talking about, he goes, although there's nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the, to the third heaven, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except my weaknesses. So Paul's referring to a moment where, you know, like 14 years ago, and most people, most uh, theologians and people say, it's when he, there's a time in Acts where he was like preaching to the people. They turned on him and stoned him. And they dragged him out and thought he was dead. And maybe he was, I don't know. But he had this time where God allowed him to have this vision. And you could say, well, wow, I can have visions. Yeah, but keep them to yourself. <laughs> Why? Because the word of God now is finished, and Paul, you're not Paul, and Paul and these people were used to write it, and if it's in the scriptures, God, God made it, so we, don't, so we don't need to have, like some people have dreams or visions that maybe expand the scriptures, or even contradict you, you go, that's not true, and I'm not looking to argue, but that's not true what you're saying, and then you get all offended, because it's my dream and my vision, I'm not saying it didn't happen, it's just not true, because your vision and, mem and dream is not going to trump the scriptures. Right. And number two, why are you telling me that? Because you want me to look at you and go, whoa, God, you've got an inside? Just be humble. Be grateful. Learn what you can about it. But don't buy into your dreams or visions. We've got the word of God. Amen. It's not that God doesn't speak to you or listen to you, but make sure you go to the word of God and match it up. And then pray if you go, God, what is this? something going on here? Help me understand. But the word of God is the word of God. So he says in verse 4, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things that no one is permitted to tell. I mean, that's powerful. That's powerful. That's the imagination that we can't even grasp. That we have life to full now, but oh my gosh, you have the mind of Christ if you're in Christ. Amen. And he says, I was caught up to the third heaven. People go, whoa, what's that? Well, the first heaven is right here where we can see the sky, the, 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 the ozone. Second heaven would be at night, because that's where they use, the, they use that word more. If you look it up in the translation, it's more like, the view of it. So the second heaven would be at night where you can see the stars and they can do the telescope and see so far. That's the second heavens. The third heaven is the spiritual realm, which God is everywhere, but that is like God. It, it indicates that somehow heaven is up because even Stephen and people look up and they see God, but that's the spiritual realm that we can't see. That's the, that's the, that's the third heaven. And that's what he says. So he really had a raised consciousness to share with us through the spirit. And that's why he gives it to us. We go, whoa. So heaven is awesome, but it is. Think about it. It's inexpressible. Yeah. Come on. It's like, wow, just as amazing as your imagination is. And Jesus says, I came to give you life to the full and adventure. 
right now. Keep it adventurous. Mix it up. Don't just get in your routine. It's your fault if you get in a rut. Don't be going, I can't do anything. I got this church meeting. Forget letting Satan blame you for that. Go take a dance class. Go to a marsh. Whatever you want to do, a paint. You can do whatever you want to do. Actually do that to reach out and use it as a platform. But have a great time. Amen. Mix it up. Don't just get stuck. In 1 Peter chapter 8, I mean chapter 1, verse 8, my favorite scripture. I gave this to the church about a couple of years ago for a memory scripture. Uh, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says, Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him. And look at this, are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I wasn't there this morning when I was looking at the ceiling, my up look at the ceiling moment. And you've all had it, if you think about it. If you haven't, wait till you have the next one. <laughs> well, I'm in bed. Well, that's right, but you're not supposed to stare at it like, for longer than just turning around going, i got to get up. If you just stay in bed going, you might want to search your mind. Maybe there's an issue that you want to solve, or you're thinking that, you know, something you want to fi figure out. Yes. <laughs> but it says here, you're filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. And it says, for you are receiving... The goal, the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I walk myself back into that, not just because it's Easter. For me as a disciple, I need to understand that every day. Amen. And, uh, you know, Jesus said we pass from an existence to life. Amen. See, until you really understand the walk with God, once you're saved, you don't just wait on heaven and go, this is a nightmare. I just got to wait. I'm no, you need to look and see the truth when you're truly converted into Christ. Life you see spiritually. It's like this old movie called The Matrix. There was the one pill you could see that would just have you believe the lie and go, this is human existence. We're all yeah. existing. Or it opens your eyes and sees the battle, the, sp the real truth. But it's a battle as well, but it's an adventure. And he's, Jesus said, hey, you enter the gate with me and you get right with me. Yeah, you are going to be saved by the dying on the cross for your sins and resurrection. But I'm, right now, you're not, I'm not going to zap you up. You're still going to be living with this imperfect body and the challenges and all the, and your own sin to fight yeah. and overcome and pray for uh, forgiveness and strength. But it says, I, Jesus did not say, hey, come on in, and now you just got to exist, be in an existence. No, I'm going to take you out of that, and I'm going to give you a life. Amen. Come on, Chris. Come on. Yeah. Look in... Uh, in verse, uh, I'm going to jump forward here. Uh, let's go to uh, point number two is God wisdom goes far beyond common sense. Did I say point number two already? All right, yeah, point number three. Yeah, yeah, that'll work. I was kidding. God's wisdom goes far beyond common sense. Common sense won't save you. Religion, religion won't save you. Now, common sense can go hand in hand with wisdom, because if you're walking with God, He's not saying jump in front of a car. That you know, God gave you your brain, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. To see the spiritual realm and be open into the understanding of of the spiritual realm correctly, not deceived. In James one five, it says here. James one five, and you know, uh, because it's Easter, we are in the book of James next week. Uh, Mark's going to preach what he wants, so after that, we'll go back in the Mark of James. I mean, the book of, the book of James, the Mark of James. Because Mark, you know, I want Mark to be able to be just, just uh, you know, tee off and go with what he wants to do. It's going to be great to hear his story. In James 1, 5, it says, if, anyone, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like, the, is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind that person should not expect to receive anything from the lord uh it, 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 it you know it goes on to say such a person is double-minded and, and unstable in all they do now we're going to break this down now now wisdom he says ask for the wisdom james means the ability to make wise decisions in difficult circumstances now part of that is conventional wisdom learning from your mistakes right but that's as a Christian now, you still got to make the, the, the wise decisions at a, as a Christian. Like a true disciple wouldn't move somewhere where there's not a true church of disciples for the money. Amen. Yeah. Come on, Chris. Wouldn't, can't God go anywhere? Yeah, but I'm not even going to go into it. If you know the scriptures, you're going to understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Come 
uh, what's best for you. That's just an example. Um, whenever we need wisdom, we can pray to God, and he will generously supply what we need. Christians don't have to grope around in the dark. That's what he's saying. Amen. Hoping to stumble upon answers. I hope God works. No, he's working. Come on. May not be in your time. It's maybe yes, no, or not yet, but he's working. Uh, and, and we need to ask God for guidance. And God always answers our prayers when we ask him, but not in our time. Or maybe he's answered it, and you still don't get the, you don't get the, you feel like you were expecting something else, and the answer's already been given, and you're not seeing it correctly. Right. Um, you know, I could have said, why did this happen, and can I be healed when I get out of the hospital after four days? Why do I, and then he hasn't even answered that question. So now i got to look at other things and go, what am I learning? Amen. And not try to go why, but what, and, and then I know perseverance, I know faithfulness, I know trusting you when I don't trust. These are all the things I have to re-grab, mm -hmm. just like you would in trials. Yep. So wisdom, there's three distinctive characters from God's wisdom. One, even, even though it, it is practical, God's wisdom relates to our lives even during the most trying times. That's what you have to remember. You don't jump off the boat or jump over the fence, spiritually speaking. If you entered through the gate and you're part of God's kingdom, you need to not jump the fence and go, I, I'm going to make this on my own. That's what we're tempted to do. That means you break trust and start doing it your own way, yeah. and which would be disobedience to God. Some people jump over the fence and say, I'm one of God's people, and we're not ones to judge. But if you didn't know the scriptures well enough, you're loved, and God, but, but you won't, you, you, when you find God, he will say, why didn't you humble out? Because you can jump the fence. There's a lot of people who jump the fence and go, I'm part of God's people. We're not to say that, but the Bible makes it clear who is. Yeah. It's practical. It's, it is not isolated from suffering and trials only, but it gives us resources to overcome them. An intelligent person may have profound ideas, but a wise person puts profound ideas to use in order to choose the best course of action. So use your brain God gave you, but don't just bank it on your... IQ or what you know book smart wise it's valuable but yeah. don't bank it on the that's not the end that's not the end it's the wisdom of God that can use that to make spiritual decisions the second thing is it's it is divine when you ask God for wisdom he's not going to give you stuff you can find in the encyclopedia he's not going to give you stuff you can learn he's going to give you stuff to use from your intellect and your experiences and now he's going to help you understand what's best in God's eyes for you to do not just what's a good idea, what's best. Right. And it's divine. God's wisdom goes beyond common sense, like I said. Mm -hmm. Common sense does not help us react joyfully in the middle of adversity. Mm -hmm. Common sense doesn't, you, you can get a bad attitude just with common sense, but how do you get out of that bad attitude? Or how do you get yourself joyful in spite of a very, very hard time? Common sense won't do it. Even if people give you, hey, just, you know, smile. Have an ice cream. You know, you got to pray. You got to get down deep. You got to understand God Almighty, give me that wisdom. Come on. God's wisdom begins with respect for him. You are God and I am not. Amen. Leads us to follow his direction. If we have respect for him, we humble out to the word of God and follow it. Come on. So, uh, and increases our ability to tell right from wrong according to him. Maturity and immaturity, like we've been talking about it. Uh, so this kind of wisdom is described at length in James 3. We'll get to that later in the chapter. Uh, and then it's Christ-like. When we ask for wisdom, we are ultimately asking to be more like Christ. Amen. James was Jesus' half-brother. The word of God in the new covenant is always follow Jesus. Jesus, Lord, strive to do What's, what Jesus would approve of. Yeah. They used to have those bracelets, remember? WWD. JD, what would Jesus do? That's literally correct. <laughs> and if you ever have seen the constant rolling of huge waves at a sea, because it goes on in verse 6, right? Don't be like a wave in the sea. Uh, and he says you can't be like that. You're not going to understand it. See, it's a, it's a conditional again. Yeah. You need to get time with God. You've got to be with God if you're, not, if you're doubting. Or if you're struggling, you got to be with God first. Just be with God, not just want the answers. It's not a counseling session with an hour elapsed. God, I want to be close to you. But then sometimes you got to get close before you can even have your faith connect. Yeah. 
and it says, uh, you know, the huge waves of the sea, how restless are they? And they're subject to such outside circumstances, the winds, the gravity, the tide. Do you want to be subject to outside circumstances to get peace inside you? No. But that's what we all do as human beings. If we don't go for the wisdom of God, we can't beat it. Yeah. And it's a natural human instinct. I'm going to be affected by the outside circumstances right. for my joy. Right. That's a nightmare. That means you have no control. You just got to be hoping I don't get hit today by something. Right. Versus God says, hey, be fired up to get hit. Remember, he says, rejoice when all trials. Remember, we did that last week. Rejoice when trials come. So, you know, uh, to believe and not doubt means believing not only in the existence of God, but also in his loving care. See, just the intellectual belief won't save you. That's just the tip. He said, come in, man. Come all the way in with me. I'm going to give you an unimaginable adventure the way you're going to look at my, your life. Good, bad, and ugly. The challenges. Because I not only want you to believe in me, which he does, but I want you to believe that I lovingly care for you. Yes. That's awesome. Amen. A person who doubts is not completely convinced that God's way is best. Just be real. If you doubt, it's natural. And if you're right or if you know God or not, doubting is natural for human beings. Yeah. But you got to ask yourself as a Christian, a person who doubts is not completely at, this, at that time convinced that God's way is the best. That's okay. That's why you got to get back into the doctrine, the word of God. Watch your life and doctrine. That's why you search. When you made the decision, this is God's word, I believe this is God's truth. Man, you just go back to his truth with prayer, talking to brothers and sisters, but you get back to the doctrine and go, okay, I'm struggling. I'm not convinced that your way is best. And you may find in the scriptures, the way he's calling you to be is actually not what you're hoping for. Yeah. So now you got to not lean on your understanding and go in it. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it got worse. He prayed all night. What happened? He got up, and he got, it didn't, God didn't take it away. He even said, take this cup away. Yeah. I don't really want to die, but if it's your will, let's do it. So he prays, and then he gets done. He gets the strength, and then he gets rested and beaten and tortured and dragged and killed. <laughs> Everything got worse from a human point of view. Yeah. Didn't get better. Come on. So isn't that true, though? If we doubt, we're not, at that moment, with that doubt, we're not completely convinced that God's way is best, yeah. which is cool. Be real and then go to God and show where your true faith is. And are you going to trump your feelings and obey, and obey even when you don't feel like it? Yeah. See, evangelizing the world is not going to get it done if we just go, I feel like it today. And tomorrow or the next, you know, maybe a week later, I'll feel like it again right. um, to reach out. So, you know, I think uh, the cross, it's an amazing reminder, Easter Sunday. It's incredible to know he raised from the dead. It's a party. Yeah. You know, don't get beat yourself up. Remember I said that last week. Don't beat yourself up. We're not, we're never going to measure up. Yeah. P Tim Second Timothy says, be strong in the grace. Amen. That's the walk. Not making excuses, not using it as a scapegoat, and God, I'm going to use you and send it up. No, yeah, yeah. you're striving to your best, but not understand you're going to always need that beautiful grace. And as long as you're learning and growing, don't beat yourself up. Amen. That's what we do in the world, and that's what we're taught to do to each other. Like, always critique. Always say there's something you could change. You could have done this better. God says you're awesome. I love you the way you are. I'm just not going to leave you that way. But you're okay as long as you're humble and wanting to still have me as the mentor, father, big brother. Yeah. I care for you. I have loving care. So I'm going to do it. You're, as long as you're willing to go help me, God, I need a reset. Boom. Amen. Even if you haven't got there, you're like, I want to yeah. help me. And you may struggle for a while on that. Don't beat yourself up. If your heart's in the willingness to change, you're there. Yes. yes. The, uh, awesome. Um, and then... Uh, my alarm's going to go off in two minutes. So we had a raise to a new consciousness, and then let's just close out with this scripture here in uh, Acts 7, 51. The ultimate way to get out of it is, remember I said last time, show up when you don't feel like showing up. And that means do the good you ought to do or, don't sin, or you sin. And as a disciple, so 
coming together and devoted to meetings of the body. They met every day. Coming together encourages one another. It helps friends and people that were reaching out actually see the love and the truth. We're not better than anybody, but we're literally worshiping God and helping, but we're not better than anybody. We're just understanding we're following the doctrine the best we can, and we are beggars that found bread, and now we want to share the bread with other people, but we're still learning, right? So let's look in uh, uh, Acts 7. 51. Here's Stephen, the first martyr recorded in the Bible. Jesus was fired up. You stiff-necked people. Wow, he's fired up. He's, he's laying out the religious people who are refusing. They stop. They go, I'm not going to believe that. Bingo. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You're not listening, so to speak. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteousness. And now you portrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was given you through the angels, but you haven't obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, up, and saw the glory of God, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look! He said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and said, Aah! I think they probably did that. And, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him. I mean, ticked off to the scream, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. They were, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold their sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. See, we have to be like Jesus. Jesus said, Lord, uh, Father, forgive them. On the worst moment when he, before he gave his spirit to God, we need to have that heart. And you know what? Most of the scriptures all elsewhere say Jesus sat down at the right hand. It's not like he's just sitting there doing nothing. It's a statement of authority and submission and right there in God and Jesus are overseeing everything. But he only stood up this time. Why? Because he was the first martyr that died for his faith. Yeah. He died for his faith, Amen. and it was the last time the title Son of Man was used in the Bible. Wow. It was last time. And the reason was it was, a, it was a Masonic title that had been used through the, when Jesus had, before Jesus died. It was still the Old Covenant. And even in Daniel, I'm not going to go there, but Daniel 7, verse 13, it talks about seeing one like the son of man coming so it actually predicts that so guys awesome. you want to have that unimaginable adventure yes. see jesus and god almighty see the spiritual reality before you're gonna die Amen. and keep it real and help each other keep it real Amen. because without the cross we wouldn't have the resurrection and we wouldn't be able to raise from the dead either and to god be the glory Amen.